David Bowie. Uh, he changed my life. David Bowie, right? In the backs of the rooms at the maths lessons, we used to do drawings of a lad insane. Top. For 25 years, one man has shocked and fascinated his audience. He said, you have different colour eyes. It just blew me away. <sighs> He's always just finding new ground. I think he was he was so innovative because he was a bit mad. Say the question again, because I, I, I was only half this. I only heard sex. <laughs> David Bowie is back with a new album outside and a British tour. So will the new project restore his credibility to its former heights, or has Rock's favourite chameleon finally lost the plot? He started that character, didn't he? He started the character Ziggy Stardust, and then he, he said he actually started believing he was this character that was like a god. One minute I was travelling through the train in Siberia, and the next minute I was uh, in the gutter somewhere in Tokyo, you know, flat me back. Bowie created Ziggy Stardust and became the ultimate rock star. The 70s were a, a real first blossoming of some seeds that were planted in the 60s. I was just sort of there at that time and came to represent in a, in a physical way the kind of questionings that people were beginning to have, whether it be civil rights or whether it be a new uh, way of dealing with sexuality. Was it important for you to kill off the old characters to be... Well, I'm not murderous by nature. <laughs> However, there are a few corpses in my life, which we won't go into. Well, you probably will. I'm not going to. <laughs> a decade later, the cult rock image was gone and Bowie had reinvented himself yet again. Let's Dance became one of the biggest selling albums of the early 80s and Bowie was hurled into pop superstardom. Let's Dance was a huge commercial success. <sighs> yeah. Remind me. <laughs> we used to play Let's Dance, put on your rich. We used to play that at the clubs. The three albums in all, like Let's Dance, Tonight, Never Let Me Down, were monster commercial things for me. It was really kind of mundane, all that. Like trotting out there, singing big hits, and then going to the bank. It was. Uh, And the tours were like absurd. I was playing to like 70, 80,000 people, you know. But if you're playing to that many people, you've got to sing stuff that they really, really know. And I was just painting myself into this corner, you know. I really do believe that at times the mainstream can be just a, a, a it's a, a tyranny in some ways. At the time, it was quite a problem to get over. It took me a couple of years to sort myself out from that. Did I read somewhere you said that that was kind of your lowest point? As yeah. As your creativity yeah. was concerned? Yeah, I really felt, you know... I just started painting a lot again. That's where I got back into, you know, what I, I used to do when I was a kid, which was do a lot of painting. And so I turned to that for solace. <laughs> I thought, well, if I can't be artistic in music, I'll, I'll, I'll just become a painter again. Bowie ran for cover and re-emerged in 1989 with a new rock-based project. But then I met Reeves Cabrels and, and uh, we formed Tim Machine and that was really a very freeing experience for me because uh, I immediately broke up all idea of what on earth I was supposed to be in the public's mind. The critics slated it as his worst musical effort to date. Even loyal fans questioned the new direction and Bowie's musical credibility suffered a massive blow. I only write for myself. I don't take much regard for my audience, whoever they might be. David Bowie is nowadays is over concerned with making an important statement. They grow and they, they shrink. They grow, they shrink. I don't think he's done much but well, I don't think he's done anything since uh, Ashes to Ashes. To be honest with you, I don't think what he's doing now is particularly important. I screw up in major ways. I'd much prefer to have a magnificent disaster than a mediocre success. You belong in rock and roll. 
What I was left with was a, a new chance to actually get back to where I, I, I really belonged. In 1993, Bowie would out Foxy's critics again. Working once more with Let's Dance producer Niall Rogers, he delivered the critically acclaimed Black Tie White Noise album. I said, look, the last thing we're going to make is another Let's Dance. I like working with Niall in as much that he, to me, represents a very strong American kind of music, a, a rhythm and blues um, structure that, that, that I've always admired so much. I used to wait outside closed record stores to, their own, to be the first in town to get the new Little Richard single. I was just crazy about him. Fast on me now. And then eventually people like John Lee Hooker. In 1992, Bowie was again at the centre of press attention when he married Somali model and actress Iman. What quality in Iman do you admire most? There's nothing about her I don't love. <laughs> she's loving, she's sensitive, she's sexy as hell. I don't know, you know, I love her. Another important person in your life is your son. Yeah. Joe. How does he feel about having a megastar pop dad? We don't talk about it very much. I think he thinks it's all rather funny. <laughs> I mean, I play him, like, the things that I do and he laughs. He says, <laughs> he says I can't believe you, I can't believe you, Dad. He said, you still, he said, how come you still get so excited about it all? But I wonder why, yes, I wonder Despite having a home in Switzerland, Bowie now spends most of his time living in the States. In this country, it's like two nations living within sight of each other, but not anywhere near. Does that cause you problems with your personal life? No. Uh, you get the odd comment, obviously, you know, one always does. But it's, it's, um, you're kind of in that strange position where the celebrity factor almost presents some kind of cocooning to that, you know, because they say, oh, it's David and Iman. But I'm always terribly wary about the celebrity thing anyway, because you kind of think, well, what? You know, where would I be in their eyes if I wasn't who I was? In the US, there were rumours of a return to form when Bowie took another musical leap in the right direction. He's a cool guy. And you, you heard about his new uh, Nine Inch Nails extravaganza? In September, Bowie stole the limelight when he toured with cult rock band Nine Inch Nails. I've always thought of myself more as considered like the, that eccentric, limey, whatever. Hello. <laughs> Beer, Beer nuts. nuts. That comes over intermittently and does a tour and then goes away again. And it's sort of, you know, like that. I used to drum along to Ziggy Sardis. Did you? Kurt Cobain says some great things about my stuff when I've been in interviews and then Trent and all that. And uh, I became aware that with the new bands, uh, it was really the first crop of bands that were kind of being influenced by what I'd been doing. It seems Bowie continues to be inspired by the younger generation of British artists. I like Goldie and a guy called Gerald. They're kind of like my, my fave raves this week. I tend to be more interested in the material that's on the edge, you know, on the periphery of the mainstream. Tricky especially, I think, is so cool. It's really interesting. I mean, it's, uh, it's a real great uh, example of, of real hybridization of music forms. Never afraid to take creative risks, Bowie was a multimedia artist before the term was coined. In April, he exhibited his artwork at London's Cork Street Gallery. That was really brave. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed it tremendously. It was really interesting to see uh, the kinds of people that came into the show, from haters to lovers. Do you think that there's a... Not too many old lovers, actually. <laughs> in England, if you dare suggest that you have more than two or three hats, it's like, oh, you don't know your station in life. You know, it's like you, 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 you're above yourself and uh, don't forget your place. And, and it gets like that, you know. Do you worry about your artistic credibility now? <laughs> when, when haven't I? <laughs> in the UK, the jury was still out. But one project was about to put him back in the frame. The best thing he's done in recent years was when he did this, the theme song for the Buddha of Suburbia, which was actually a classic David Bowie song. And it was obviously kind of influenced by the fact that he was brought up in South London. It was about, the whole thing was about South London. And it was rather a moving song, with a great David Bowie kind of melody and all the rest of it. Yeah. 
Hanif wanted me to do the music for his uh, book, which was a play to TV. And so I just went in there and fooled around. I think David Bowie's been having a hard time over the last few years, although apparently he's supposed to have finished a very good album with Eno, who's the bloke we made a lot of his very innovative work with. He's always had partners to work with, like he had like Mick Ronson and Brian Eno and all the rest of it. If you listen to Black Tie and then listen to Buddha and then listen to Outside, there's really a line going through it. You, you definitely know where I'm going. Why did you decide to work with characters again? I thought that that was again you finished. So much, yeah, and me too. I'd taken a lot of like articles out of magazines and some of my old poems, and uh, I fed all this information into the computer, um, and I've got a program in it that cuts everything up, all the words, and, and recomposes them. And so I improvised to the music, grabbing bits and pieces off all these different sheets of paper. Probably it's the way you start thinking when you did, you did a lot of drugs and you don't do them anymore but you're still thinking in a fractured, broken-up way. There's a guy called Nathan Adler, um, uh, who's an art detective. Set in the fictional Oxford town, the album's part of a five-year project with Brian Eno. It will encompass a lot more characters than just the seven I've got so far, you know, because this town will take any number of characters, so it might widen up. It might be a cast a hundred. A lot of your music's based around the future. Yeah, I think I use the future more as a, a place to put my thoughts. I'm not sure that I really believe in it as a place, you see. You're, you're playing Andy Warhol. Yeah. That's obviously another hat. <laughs> it's more of a, like a white wig. It was so funny, you know, because uh, uh, I said, look, we've got, we got, we got to get the look right. So they got his stuff from the uh, Pittsburgh Museum, and it was so strange because you could smell him on it. All these perfumes all over the clothes and the wig and everything, you know. And that very, very sweet, I thought, a stick of pancake <laughs> in his handbag so he'd look so he could cover his spots when he went out. I don't derive that much pleasure from actually acting. It's not on my list of priorities. I don't have that driving need to be an actor. You're coming to England? Yeah. When, and when I'm you come not going to tell you anything about it. So how does Bowie cope with being hailed as a pop legend? I'd be a fool not to be aware of what my contribution has been to music over the years. You know, I kind of hear traces of it here, there and everywhere. He's written some of the greatest songs in rock and roll. Well, one lifetime. Rock God. Great innovation. Symbol. He's someone that I was, would aspire to. I don't deal with it. <laughs> you kidding me? He definitely contributed to, to pop music in, in a major, major, major way. It's a bit like being a, a bit like being a, 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 an eraser, a rubber, because what you spend half your time doing is wiping out everything that people thought before. I think that's my job anyway, is to continually say everything you knew was wrong. <laughs> but I wonder how many people know David Bowie is really. I was thinking this. People watch the Ozone, they don't even know who he is.